Uh, it's uh, 1 50 p.m. on Monday, the 25th of February, 2008. I'm in uh, Bridge Hall at the um, Marshall School of Business at the University of Southern California, and we're about to speak to Morley Winograd and Michael Hayes, who are uh, co authors of Millennial, Millennial Makeover, MySpace, My YouTube, and the Future of American Politics, to be published any day now. A uh, welcome, uh, uh, Morley and uh, uh, Michael, to the show. Thank you very much, Mark. Glad to be here, and the book's available now. Uh, uh, tell us about your day jobs and how you got together to write this book. Uh, I work here at the Marshall School of Business and involved in communication technologies and uh, always had a hobby of politics and I've been joined in that political hobby by Mike Hayes who's been a friend of mine for over 30 years and Mike can tell you what he does. Uh, I'm uh, currently retired from uh, as the Vice President of Entertainment Research at Frank and Magan Associates uh, which is a major uh, marketing research and consulting firm primarily in the broadcast industry, but communications generally. All right, tell us who the millennials are. Millennials are people under 25 years old, uh, the next generation that follows from Gen X, and uh, they are an optimistic, can-do, group-oriented bunch that are transforming America and its politics. And what particular psychological and historical factors shape their political orientation? Uh, their political orientation is primarily shaped, uh, as would be the case in many of most generations, by the way the uh, generation was reared. And they were reared in a manner that was protected, uh, uh, group-oriented by their parents, and that in turn has made them the kind of political beings that they are turning into. Think of, think of the Huxtables show and Bill Cosby's show in which the way he raised his kids turned out to be the way a generation of parents decided to raise these millennials. Uh, the Huxtables were rather upscaled. Are, are, are millennials of all social classes? And, and is the upbringing that they uh, uh, received that led to their political orientation uniform across uh, social classes? Well, Mike's done the survey research and he can speak to the data. In general, we find little racial, ethnic, or even gender differences amongst this, members of this generation. But on the survey data, in terms of their attitudes being common, Mike can comment better. Um, first of all, yes, they were reared, regardless of their social class, they were reared in, by and large, the same manner. Um, they are a diverse generation, as Morley mentioned, uh, the most diverse generation, as well as the largest generation in U.S. history. 40% uh, of them are either African American or Latino or Asian or mixed race, and 20% uh, of them actually have a parent who is an immigrant. And this is, uh, that and the way they are reared has led them to be a very tolerant generation in terms of its uh, ethnic attitudes, in terms of its attitudes on uh, social issues, and a generation that is uh, in favor of government solutions to our major economic and societal problems. As we're going to see when we talk about some of the, the substantive uh, uh, sub uh, objects of this generation's political uh, favor, uh, would you say that uh, millennials are, are post-racial, uh, post-sexist uh, individuals as a group? Uh, I, I guess if I would use that term, I think that would, that would actually work. Just for an example, uh, nine out of ten millennials say that interracial dating is okay. Uh, that's you know, pretty much a sharp contrast to any earlier generations. Um, the majority of millennials uh, believe that gay marriage should be allowed. Um, there are as many millennial children of, uh, of college age, of, of both boys and girls and young men and women, in college. Uh, th so there's no, no gender difference in that regard. Okay. Your, your book is a sort of a, a trifecta intersect. It deals with the trifecta intersection of demographics and history and technology. Let's talk about the the uh, history part of it. Uh, you uh, borrow and amplify a scheme of alternating uh, civic and idealist generations. Could you uh, explain in general uh, what that uh, entails sure. and how that applies to the current situation? Sure. Uh, we borrow on uh, William Strauss and Neil Howe's uh, seminal work on generations. They pose four archetypes that alternate in 20-year cycles over 80 years altogether. And as you indicated, there are two of them, civic and idealist who are very uh, uh, outwardly focused, and they tend to uh, have the greatest impact on our politics, and I'll let Mike talk about the political impact, but the, uh, the way to think about it is boomers 
are a uh, idealist generation, very focused on their ideals and their ideology. And that idealism can be right wing, left wing, or middle wing. Absolutely, uh, uh, but so it's, it's very, idealism. very unlikely to be middle wing. Actually, right. most idealist generations have very uncompromising attitudes okay. towards different issues. Right. And there are, as there were and are, as many uh, conservative baby boomers as there are were liberal ones and are today. The the previous civic generation in American history was the GI generation, the folks who Tom Brokaw calls the greatest generation. And that generation, of course, along with the millennials, just to show you how their political attitudes are similar, are the only two generations that voted uh, for John Kerry in 2004. Uh, say a little bit, since we're neglecting them as usual, the Gen Xers and, and how they fit into the scheme. The Gen Xers uh, are the middle generation between the baby boomers and the millennials. Uh, first of all, they are a relatively small generation. They came along when um, having children was uh, in many instances seen as something that uh, people didn't want to do, particularly women, and so there were fewer of them. Uh, they were raised uh, in, in many instances as latchkey kids, and so they tended to be uh, a generation that is uh, independent, entrepreneurial, because uh, they had to learn how to shift for themselves since their parents really weren't helping them a lot. And uh, at least the early portion of this generation politically tended to be rather conservative, it kind of led the way to the Reagan revolution. So okay. uh, again, coming back to people's uh, context for thinking about that, uh, the sitcom Married with Children is a story of Gen X kids' childhood. <laughs> and the one that followed, Family Ties with J. Michael Fox, if you'll recall, his first date, uh, he he and his date really got along because they read uh, Milton Friedman together. Right. Um, uh, talk about the a little more detail about millennials' views uh, on substantive political issues, and more particularly about their views on process, political process, and and how they differ from uh, uh, Gen Xers and Boomers. Well, in terms of specific political issues. Uh, uh, there, there, there's a whole range of them, of course, but uh, for example, on some hot button issues like immigration, millennials, be, in large part because they themselves are so diverse, uh, don't tend to uh, favor the more stringent uh, uh, policies designed to limit immigration. Uh, they tend to, on economic issues, tend to favor uh, governmental uh, solutions, uh, uh, even to the degree of, uh, of being in favor of higher taxation to to uh, pay for things such as uh, uh, medical care, uh, widespread medical uh, care. Uh, they are very much in favor of um, uh, policies, educational policies that would trade uh, college education for uh, participation uh, in the social process. Uh, uh, and, and one of the big lines that always gets uh, uh, a lot of support at, at Obama rallies is when he talks about community service and giving four thousand dollars to every college student in exchange for community service and that it, since the, the large majority of these millennials have participated in community service programs that resonates very clearly with them. And just to underline what Mike said on that, uh, that, that particular policy is a very good capture of how millennials think about the use of government. In other words, they're not going back to old-fashioned big bureaucracies and, uh, and centralized government, but they are very much in favor of government setting the ground rules, asking people to be responsible and take responsibility for their actions, and they anticipate themselves stepping up to the plate and doing things to fix America. They are a generation who actually believes that the best way to solve most of the country's problems is through an activist role of government, and uh, very much unlike uh, certainly Gen X and half the boomers. Right. Um, contrast that with the, uh, contrast the situation that we're going to talk about now about the prospects for a millennial makeover with the stalemate that uh, boomer idealism split into two warring camps has generated. Well, the, as, as, you, as you just said, the boomers were in fact a highly divided generation. Initially, I think people when they saw the anti-war demonstrations, thought of the, de uh, the generation as being a, a liberal or progressive generation, and, and, and maybe half or maybe a little less of, of the boomers are in fact that. But there were as many uh, boomers who were members, uh, more in fact, who were members of Young Americans for Freedom than there were uh, uh, SDSers. And uh, uh, 
just as, as Bill Clinton is a boomer, so is Newt Gingrich uh, an equally strong boomer. And, and, and this, this is a generation that simply found it very difficult to compromise with one another. They held these deeply held ideological beliefs, and they, and, and, and they found it difficult to work together. So in 1968, you had a political realignment where the Democratic majority that had been in, in existence since 36 with, uh, 32 with Roosevelt shifted to sort of a Republican domination. It took all the way to 1994 before the Republicans took over Congress. Reagan, they, Reagan Democrats. Right, in a word. But, be, but exactly. You, get, you saw the Reagan Democrats come in on social issues. You saw the tendency towards independent voting and ticket splitting, uh, which was uncommon in prior years. And what are actually very specifically Mike's uh, 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 survey research shows and his analysis shows is that these realignments, which occur about every 40 years in American history, is going to occur again. And because this one is r going to be triggered by the emergence of a civic generation, not an idealist generation, instead of gridlock and disagreement, which has been the historical pattern of idealist-led realignments, we're going to get the kind of a realignment that America got in 1932, not on a po policy level, but at a uh, partisan level, where people become very partisan. One party gains the upper hand because so many millennials believe in one party's ideas, and those ideas will become the dominant force in American politics. Okay, before we talk about which party that is, uh, I just want to um, revisit this idea that the stalemate we've got in Congress now is really a reflection of the, the um, uh, stalemate we had in cam on campuses uh, yeah. 40 years ago. We got the cultural wars still going on only in the halls of Congress. And another way to look at this is that, that the, the idealist realignment essentially took place in different stages. In, in 1968, when Nixon was elected president, uh, it, essentially the change occurred at the presidential level. The South became a solid, solidly Republican area, and, uh, and, and the Republican Party began to adopt traditionalist positions on many issues. Reagan in the 1980s uh, made the revolution, the conservative revolution, on a more economic basis, and finally by 1994, then the Republicans took complete control of government and, uh, and, and when they won Congress. In that but, year. But, but even having done that, you still see deadlock. You still haven't seen either party enable, uh, being able to enact their agenda, and that's because they simply can't ever get around to agree. Okay, right. Now, in, in the Democratic uh, race, we've got a archetypal <coughs> boomer, uh, Hillary Clinton, and we have what I've calculated as a tail end boomer <laughs> in Barack Obama. What, what's based on what we've been talking about so far? Which of them? This is a uh, softball question. <laughs> which of them appeals to the millennials? Well, uh, without uh, putting our own prejudgment on it, uh, almost from the beginning of his campaign, as as a year ago today, actually, um, uh, Barack Obama was speaking about generations. And he deliberately, in Selma, Alabama, characterized uh, the, uh, the Clinton boomer generation as a Moses generation, saluting them for their ability to change things, bring about new ideas, uh, cause uh, movements to occur. Confront Pharaoh. Confront Pharaoh, let my people go. S successfully, except they, of course, never got to build anything. And so he They've taught, wandered in the desert for 40 years. Well, and that was to get rid of that middle generation, which right. today that, would be right. 10Xers, but that's, we won't talk right. about them that's in right. the desert. Uh, but then he talked about the Joshua generation, which is a civic generation in the, in the schematic of these uh, cycles. And it, of course, got everybody together to march around the walls of Jericho. And when everybody in unison was able to uh, knock down those walls, they were able to build uh, what became the uh, Israelite uh, kingdom. So, so he was very much signaling that he was of the Joshua generation. As you point out, in age, he's not. But in attitude and in his uh, campaign, he is very much a uh, pointing towards that civic or millennial generation. And he's gendered the support uh, in almost every instance of that generation. And, and as you can see, uh, as one can see when you look at the voting results, uh, uh, upwards of 65, 70, 75 percent of people 18 to 20 for 18 to 29, uh, the millennials are voting for Obama in large measures, and it crosses all sorts of lines. It's not it, it, it's it's white as well as African American, and even some Latinos in that age group. Uh, it's it's both men and women in that age group. So it's not it's not the segmented uh, division within that age group, but it's actually pretty much across 
the, the entirety of the, of the uh, demographic spectrum. And there was this great tableau, which we've written about post the book, on the night of the Iowa caucuses. Um, uh, Obama carried young people in the caucuses about six to one, I believe. And, um, and when he came out to give his acceptance speech and everybody first really recognized his campaign and who he was, he was surrounded by young people of all colors and kinds. And then Hillary, who had earlier come out, and standing behind her was Madeleine Albright and her husband and other uh, members of the Clinton administration, all of whom very much looking their age. And uh, between Iowa and New Hampshire, the Clinton campaign figured all that out. Uh, those people were all gone by the time of the New Hampshire primary behind her. And of course, she was able to cut the millennial margin down to two to one. But that's about as, in New Hampshire, that's about as she's ever, as well as she's ever done, losing two to one among millennials okay, in before, primary. Before we get back to the politics, I wanted to talk about the social science here. Y you've actually set out a schema here that makes predictions, and in fact, they've been verified in the real world. Uh, that, is, uh, that is what we've done. Somebody read the book and said that we had uh, seen history before it happened and wrote about it. Uh, but it really, uh, first of all, we owe a great debt to the Strauss and Howe books for setting up the scheme. And what uh, we've done in this book is basically go back and look at American political history, these cycles of 40-year generations. And as you said earlier, we overlay a technological cycle, which seems to, technology seems to come along about in those same 40-year time periods, which the young generation is very facile with and very able to use and very comfortable using. And politicians figured out, and one of them uses it to gain their allegiance. So FDR on radio, Richard Nixon on television, and now Barack Obama on social networks. Uh, let's talk about that a little bit more. What are the uh, distinctions between uh, previous campaigns and what the Obama campaign has been able to do with uh, uh, new media? Well, the most visible thing, of course, is the amount of money in small donations that the Obama campaign has been able to raise. If you go to Obama's website, it is not a website. It is a social network platform. In fact, it was created by one of the founders of Facebook who volunteered his time, Chris Young, to the Obama campaign. And that's why they have 650,000 people all talking to each other and urging each other and motivating each other to support him, be it uh, turning out to vote, organizing caucus activities or get out the vote activities, or giving money regularly and frequently. And the traditional top-down view, of course, is not only seen in the Clinton campaign, we don't want to pick on Hillary by herself, it's seen in almost every Republican campaign, where the unwillingness to let peer-to-peer -peer conversation happen interferes with their ability to leverage the organizing power of social networks. And, and the Democrats have figured out how to do it. Obama's the best case. It not only reflects itself in money, but in these caucus margins where text messaging, social network bulletin board postings, uh, email messages, well, the, not really email because they don't use it, but IM messages, um, all of that is driving these uh, millennials to the polls. Okay, now this, this sounds, from the point of view of people who want progressive change, a, a kind of ideal perfect storm. You've got a large cohort of now politically involved people who uh, share both substantive and process views who are mobilizing uh, themselves through the latest technology. Uh, what, if anything, stands in the way of a, uh, a vast transformation of American uh, politics and life? I, well, I, I would think that would probably be, uh, 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 assuming that one would regard a Republican victory, a possible Republican victory in, a, in an election this year, in the election this year, as, as doing that, I think there are a couple of things that could um, prevent this from occurring. Uh, first of all, uh, if the campaign is actually waged on matters of, of national security, things of this sort, the Republicans still do have a bit of an advantage there, although not as much among millennials as they do older generations. But if, if an event occurs that has the public focusing in that direction. And secondly, I think if the, the campaign somehow is waged on the social issues that have, that have divided the country over the past 40 years, if, if, if somehow the electorate is forced to, uh, to focus in that direction. It, is it, is it, that within the control of any of the campaigns, or is that uh, in the hands of history, or the hands of Al-Qaeda, or, or where does the initiative lie now in terms of what's going to happen? Well, I would think in terms of, of, of the national security 
problems. Obviously, there may be events that would occur that, that neither of the political campaigns can control. And if one of those bad events took place, would that um, refute the arguments that we've been making here about the demographic and technological and attitudinal changes? Well, not necessarily, but uh, millennials are very, very concerned about security. This is the 9-11 generation. Uh, it's also the Columbine, Virginia Tech, and Northern Illinois generation. So if matters of security rise to the top and the Democratic candidate doesn't respond appropriately, then you could have that opening. Uh, and obviously McCain would, would uh, relish the opportunity to debate security from now to the end of the campaign. Uh, but but it, it is still in the hands, as Mike said, of the Democratic candidate to be responsive on that issue, and, and they may well be whoever that candidate is. Just a little bit more about McCain. You talked about the, the tableau around um, uh, Obama, the, uh, the changing tableau, the flip-flopped tab tableaus around uh, Hillary Clinton. Uh, I had a picture of McCain in one of his good days. There were all old white men behind him. Uh, how and his is, wife. And his, and his wife. How, how, how is uh, an Obama-McCain confrontation going to stack up in the uh, schema that you've uh, been outlining? Well, I guess uh, I would think that Obama would have certainly the advantage among millennials uh, over, over John McCain, although I would argue that of all the Republican possible contenders, McCain probably would have the best opportunity to deal with them. One, the security issue that Morley mentioned. Two, he seems to be a little less ideological, a little less con uh, ideologically conservative than the other Republican candidates uh, were. Uh, the one problem he may have uh, is that some of the compromises, some of the things he's had to do to reassure conservatives may, uh, on the other hand, uh, turn off millennials to, to a degree. But of the, of, the, of the Republican candidates, I think he would be the strongest among millennials. Yeah, I think that's correct. Uh, McCain has a unifying message, not as big a unifying message as Obama. Millennials are looking for somebody who cares about the whole group, wants a win-win solution, just the way they make decisions with their friends on Facebook and so, or on MySpace. And so that unity theme is very appealing, and McCain is the only Republican, and one of the reasons I think he won the, the primaries. Uh, nomination is well, the only Republican making that kind of appeal. I do think we should also mention on the issues of the campaign that according to the civic, the historical analysis, this will be a campaign about economics, S secondarily foreign policy, way off the table the social issues which um, uh, tend to fade into the background in, in these kinds of civic realignments. And on economic issues, uh, clearly the Democratic Party's argument for fairness and equity and everybody getting a chance and the kind of health care programs and others that they're advocating are much more appealing to millennials. We, we've been talking about politics at the presidential level. The president uh, doesn't pass laws, Congress does. How does all of what we've been talking about relate to uh, separate uh, congressional and senatorial elections, especially because uh, co uh, Congress and uh, congressional incumbents are returned at a 92 percent uh, well, rate? Well, except already this year two, pri two ca congressional candidates in Maryland got knocked off in a primary. Which okay. Is, unbelievable. The 2006 uh, campaign, which we demonstrate in the book, was really the first sign of the realignment to come, uh, had a number of candidates winning against entrenched Republicans. Uh, Congressman Leach in Iowa is, of course, our favorite conversation, but there were many campaigns. Uh, here in California, uh, Pombo got knocked off by a guy who, you know, had lost to him two to one the year before. In almost all those kinds of cases, you saw organization taking place on the web, uh, not to the social network sophisticated degree that Obama's done it, but the initial signs of that were definitely there in 2006 and certainly in grassroots campaigning. And you saw as a result the need for money to go down because television advertising wasn't driving the particular outcome of the, of the election. So um, I would say that the, that the Democratic margins in Congress, if depends on what the candidates say and what the party advocates, and we've got a lot of campaigning to go. But nevertheless, if they allow the, the uh, generational technological forces to have their way, the Democrats will do very well in this coming election. More about and, and if I might add, yes. because Morley did not mention the, the Senate, which is right. really, I think, more, even more than the House right now, a, a, a place where the Democrats are having difficulty because they simply don't have the numbers to, to overcome the Senate rules. Uh, the fact that the Senate is now in Democratic hands, albeit narrowly, was actually uh, occurred because of, of millennial votes in, in 2006 with the defeats of George Allen and 
Virginia and Conrad Burns in Montana, primarily inspired by large millennial turnouts against them. And with the larger number of seats that the Republicans have to defend in the Senate this year, the many Republicans who are retiring, I think that does offer the opportunity for the Democrats to, to come close to getting the veto-proof majority that they might need in the Senate. And if they and get a Democrat president, they won't need a veto-proof Well, majority. that's true. They'll that's still true. need 60 votes. Right. They might get them, uh, not uh, partisan-wise, but ideologically. Mike mentioned the two Senate campaigns, Webb and Burns. It is absolutely true millennial votes were the margin of victory. It's also true that those millennials were motivated by YouTube videos of the two incumbent candidates, neither one of whom stood a chance of losing when the campaign started, one of whom was about to become the next president of the United States. But once people saw who they really were on YouTube videos taken by their opponents, the campaign was over. So in a sense, YouTube and millennials shifted the Senate to the Democrats two years ago. Um, presumably the the technological plane of all this is, evol is constantly evolving and, and the Obama campaign is uh, uh, fine-tuning the, the technology that they've got. Say something about the, the, uh, what you expect uh, or might hope for in terms of a, a carryover into incumbency of this mass uh, organization, some call it a cult, but it's certainly a, uh, a social network that uh, uses this technology in terms of process, in terms of electronic sure. democracy, in terms sure. of internet voting, in terms of consultation by the incumbent uh, yeah. uh, millennial I don't, think, I don't think you're going to see any rush to internet voting. There's still plenty of security issues, uh, as we've seen in California, with the return to paper ballots. Uh, but uh, but the Senator Obama is already the sponsor, co-sponsor, with a very conservative Republican, of something called Google Government, which allows you to, if the bill passed, to look up uh, every single earmark and who's who's advocating it and why, and uh, other experiments have already taken place in Congress on more transparency in the governmental process. The uh, the instance we cite in the book that we think is the best example of what's to come actually took place in Utah of all places in something called uh, uh, Utopia, uh, uh, Polycatopia, Polycatopia, uh, in which uh, uh, both parties agreed to allow the citizens to join in the debate on a couple of issues that were before the legislature. And uh, they had debates and the legislature picked, pitched in. It was kind of a Wikipedia of government. And as a result, people changed their mind. They thought of new ideas. Different outcomes happened, one more conservative, one more liberal. But that kind of citizen involvement, citizen debate is what we're likely to see. Um, in, in terms of the um, problems that remain, residual problems for internet voting, uh, there's a lot to be said for that. In terms of uh, shaking up the bureaucracy, uh, with Google government, uh, what do you think the prospects are for that so that the um, mass bureaucracies that exist in Washington could be uh, supplemented or replaced by more uh, uh, IT intensive technologies apart from the civil service uh, people who aren't going to want to go, apart from the special interests that already have their connections, apart from a plethora of, yeah. of constraints on that, uh, we're talking about a millennial generation that's comfortable with technology, that's using technology to put its candidate into office. Is there any hope that they'll be able to carry that through at, for a transformation of the governmental process at the legislative and the administrative bureaucratic level? Sure. In fact, uh, I spent four years uh, trying to make all that happen when I was uh, senior policy advisor to Al Gore and we were doing reinventing government in the second term of that administration. Um, then and now, there are people busily advocating and putting in place the frameworks for uh, government that uh, operates much more on the net, uh, rulemaking, procurement, uh, grant giving, all kinds of activities could be done in a transparent way uh, using electronic media. And, uh, and uh, there is a wave of retirement about to hit the uh, federal bureaucracy that will allow new people more, more comfortable with this technology to be in place. And of course, on the civil service side, only about half the federal government still works under civil service because a lot of those uh, um, uh, domains have been removed in, in legislation. So there is an opportunity. On the administrative side, I think that's where there's an enormous amount of opportunity. We'll have to see which president gets elected and how they want to organize themselves. So uh, to par paraphrase Jimmy Carter, who hasn't come up here at all, uh, we could get a government as, as uh, uh, connected as the American people. Uh, through the uh, millennial victory. Well, we would hope that they would get as connected as the millennials are. As connected as the millennials, right. Um, is what we've been talking about here in the American instance uh, a global phenomenon, or is it uh, an example of American exceptionalism? Are these trends taking place in Europe, Asia, uh, elsewhere in the 
developed world or even in the uh, developing world? Uh, that's a very good question, and I, I wish I had a complete and easy answer to it. Um, I, I think there was a point when Morley and I at one time felt that this was pretty much an, an Anglo-American kind of thing, that it, it, it was something, these, these, these generational cycles seemed to resonate more in, in the uh, UK, the United States. But uh, my company, uh, former company, Frank Maggot Associates, is actually doing work uh, with what they're referring to as millennials in other, other countries. And I think a lot of these same kinds of attitudes, certainly the, the use of technology, but also the optimism, the willingness to, tr to try new things, uh, is, is, does exist in other, other countries as well as in the United States or it's certainly the Anglo-American world. So and I've, I've seen uh, uh, commercials designed for millennials in Sri Lanka, which I thought was startling because they called them millennials. And we just uh, have seen the beginnings of the campaigns in, it, in Italy and Spain where the more liberal left side of the political spectrum has decided to try and imitate some of Obama's campaign approaches. We'll see if that really works. So I think you, if they make the mistake of thinking that this, the issue is technology, they'll be wrong. It's a combination of technology and generational attitude. It, it, one of the attitudes you mentioned is the sort of desire to work together. Would that uh, reassert itself at an uh, international, or international or global level so that millennials in all countries would want to work with millennial-based governments in the other countries and lead to some sort of global millennial transformation? Well, uh, that's, an interesting, again, an interesting question. I, we do know that at least in terms of the foreign policy approaches that millennials favor in the United, for the United States to adopt would be a more uh, uh, bilateral, unilateral, multi uh, multi multilateral, multilateral approach rather than the unilateral approach that the current administration has, <laughs> has, has adopted. All nations together, we're all in it. Strobe Talbot's uh, book, uh, The Great Experiment, is precisely about uh, uh, unilateralism versus multilateralism. He's calling for more uh, multilateralism. So it might fit in. And again, the millennials are not, I, I think, the, the idea that just because the millennial generation is, is strongly against the Iraq war doesn't mean that they are a, 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 an isolationist generation. They believe the United States should be and has to be intimately involved in international affairs, but again, in a different multilateral way rather than the unilateral way of that, that, that has been followed at least for the last eight years or so. Okay, you've been doing, you've done predicting in the book. Could you sort of look forward 10 or 15 years? Let, let's say the millennials take over, as you're saying. What's the United States going to look like in 10 or 15 years based on uh, millennial governments until then? It's going to look completely different. Um, we'll have a system of national and universal health care. We'll have a very uh, much of an involvement in the federal government at education at all levels, both in terms of uh, helping to finance the costs of college education, as well as demanding improvements in the way uh, K through 12 education takes place. You'll see a, a very, very strong green environment. The United States will have uh, taken the lead in fights against global warming. Uh, and you'll see, as uh, Mike just outlined, a very multilateralist uh, foreign policy designed to bring everybody into a collective uh, process and uh, isolating and punishing those that don't. And I would also think that, you know, from a partisan perspective, winning the election, uh, in terms of winning elections, more than likely the Democratic Party will be the majority party at that time, would probably control all branches of government, but government will act differently. It'll be look more like it did in the 1940s and 50s with bipartisan cooperation rather than bipartisan uh, uh, isolation or division. That, that has been the case since the, uh, since the mid-60s. Just a few last questions here. Would you like to provide an obituary for boomer politics and, <laughs> and, and or consolation to the cynical Gen, X, uh, cynical Gen Xers who may never have their own era of political dominance, thereby giving them even more to be cynical about? Well, I or think is that the way they, they want it? I think the Gen Xers will eventually claim Obama as one of their own. He's close enough. And if he becomes a national hero, they'll just have to accept that as their political lot in life. Um, I think Boomer Politics uh, obituary could well be written at the end of this campaign season, uh, but still... What, Boomer, would, what will the epitaph say? Uh, they, it, it's kind of like the uh, epitaph for the people running Hogwarts. They meant well, they just talked too much. Uh, why, why do you think it took uh, two Boomers to uh, explain the millennial uh, a makeover? Well, the, you're not talking to boomers, you're talking to silent generation. Oh, all right. Why did it take two silent <laughs> generation people to... Uh...
Well, right. hopefully, uh, you know, just because we are of one generation, we can still uh, look at the world and understand other generations and, and help uh, help people of various generations to understand one another. So you'll have spoken through your work here anyway. The work, the work of the silent generation is to help everybody get along. And we hope our book does that for the generations. Okay. When, when can people and where can people get get? It's, a, uh, it's available now on Amazon.com or at your local bookstore. Thank you both for talking to us very much today. Thank, Thank you. you.